Thanks to Justin for that introduction to the program. Um, what I'm going to try and do is, is teach you a little bit about radio astronomy, which is going to be a challenge for myself and for you, I think. But anyway, let's see how we go. Because people talk about the SKA and Meerkat and whatever, and you see these pictures of arrays in the crew. Uh, but in fact, how on earth do you get from an array in the crew to a radio picture? So I'm going to try and delve into a little bit of that. So let's, let's see. Right, so we'll start off sort of fairly simple looking at some uh, antenna types, um, looking at what dishes do, looking at sort of time domain signals, and then we'll go into the slightly more complicated area of uh, sort of radio interferometry, how to actually make images from these arrays. And I'll try to approach it in a very simple way. In fact, you'll see from uh, the top slide here, I've got uh, Dr. Oleg Smirnov involved here. He's our new uh, Rhodes um, SKA chair, working on sort of instrumental side of, of radio astronomy. And he also spends quite a lot of his time working from our offices in Cape Town. And he had a very good uh, tutorial on, or what I thought was a very good tutorial on the basics of radio astronomy. So I brought in a lot of his material here and I asked his permission and I've made him joint presenter even though he's not here. All right. Um, so you'll see quite a lot of the slides say Oleg Smirnov on the, on the bottom. Right, so we'll look at making radio image, we'll look at, look at making better radio images, because it's not a, not a very easy thing to make a radio image. And then even more tricky is to make these better radio images quickly. The large data rates from SK, from Meerkat, are going to really force us into new ways of operating. And then we'll sort of close off by actually looking at some of the numbers to do with data rate considerations. Right, so uh, Justin didn't show this. You'll see there's some overlap with some of the slides that Justin showed and some of them that I'll show. But um, the SK science has sort of quite a number of different areas that they're going to be looking at. Um, sort of the, the effects of uh, dark energy, the expansion of the universe, um, the epoch of reionization, uh, pulsars orbiting around black holes and black holes orbiting around each other, uh, <laughs> magnetism, and uh, I think this has to do with sort of astrobiology and the early sort of mo uh, molecules that may make up life in the universe. So a radio telescope can be used, these are all schematics by the way, none of this is, is real. It's a, a publicity material on the SK website. So radio telescopes can do a lot of really interesting things. But how do you actually get from what is essentially kind of a voltage that you do something at each antenna to do actual science like this? And we'll try and explore some of that in, in this talk. Just a comparison to kind of, I think the sort of background I assumed here was that most people in the room would be technical people. Uh, at least, um, not maybe not professionally, technically, but at least privately, technically, or whatever, and uh, have an optical optical background. So I tried to mix in a bit of optical and radio and try and show comparisons between the two. So on the right here, we've got a, a mixture of an optical and a, and a radio picture of a galaxy, radio galaxy called Fornax A. So the optical bit in the middle here is the bit you can sort of normally see, in a sense. These big orange things are. Um, the detection from the radio telescope and mm -hmm. what we believe is happening in, in the middle of here is there's a, a black hole and jets coming out and then the jets sort of interact with the very sort of diffuse gas around the galaxy and produce a sort of excite the gas and produce radio emission which the radio telescope detects. So you can see that by combining optical you get a, a much broader, a richer picture of what's actually happening in that galaxy whereas you just, if you saw that as, as an optical picture you may not even realize that there are any jets at all or anything happening in the center of that galaxy. On the left-hand side is a, a picture of uh, the hydrogen gas in, in a galaxy, um, which radio telescopes are particularly good at detecting, so sort of H1 emission. And what it's uh, sort of encoded here with a slight frequency shift due to the Doppler effect. So what we're seeing is the, the red stuff is moving away from us, uh, the blue stuff is moving towards us, and sort of all the colors in between. So basically that galaxy is kind of rotating around, uh, you kind of think of it coming sort of towards you there. And by looking at the speed of rotation things, you can also tell things about the um, dark matter content in the galaxy and, and other such matters. All right, so now back into the tutorial. Good luck to us all. Okay, so, <laughs> so radio, radio um, telescopes, <coughs> and I don't think I have to tell you this, uh, excuse me, um, they detect uh, lights, not sound. A lot of people, when you say, you're doing radio astronomy, and they go, wow, you, what are you listening to? Okay, we are sort of listening, but it's, it's, it's the same way as optical, we're detecting electromagnetic waves. So it's light, not sound. Right, so you can think of a car radio, as uh, the car radio aerial, as being a very simple radio telescope. All right, so it's, it's just detecting electromagnetic uh, waves at a lower frequency than, than light, 
uh, and it's doing it in a very simple way. And in fact, as I walked outside here just before we started, I, I suddenly <coughs> looked up and saw the PED radio telescope array, which is something that our team built uh, a few years ago, around about 2005 or so when we started out, which was ready to understand radio astronomy. So if you're completely confused after this talk, I would suggest you walk out during one of the breaks, have a look at one of the, the PED antennas, which is literally 100 meters down outside as you go straight out of here, and see how it's actually constructed. Uh, it's a very, very simple device, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it as we go. Okay, so we're looking for radio signals from space. These are naturally generated in the same way as the, the optical astronomers do. And the, uh, the signals are typically very weak, and they're, they're buried in noise. So if you can imagine a, a sort of a, a signal from a, a radio kind of antenna, it's really just a voltage, which is kind of doing like this. It's a very kind of uh, random stochastic kind of process. And... Some of that is actual noise in your instrument itself, in your electronics, in fact a large part of it often. And then sort of, uh, superimposed on top of that is a small astronomical signal. The radio signals we're detecting are extremely weak. Um, optical, I think, is quite bright by comparison. Um, radio telescopes really do, do detect extremely weak, weak signals. We've got a, a unit of uh, sort of measure of the power of the signal called the, the Jansky, which measures things in sort of 10 to the minus 26 uh, watts per square meter. So, that kind of gives you an indication of the kind of thing that we, we're working in. Okay, so our aerial is a bit more sophisticated than a car aerial. Um, this is what the, the sort of feed part of the radio telescope, which is the bit that actually takes the electromagnetic signal and, and turns it into an electrical, electrical signal. So on the front of it here, we've got the, the sort of a feed device, which is really a, a device that sort of guides the waves, in, in a sense, into the, into the, the workings of this thing in the bottom. Uh, inside of here, we've got some electronics, and we'll kind of zoom into that. So we do a sort of cutaway into that. This is the, the feed horn. The feed is sort of shaped in a certain way to kind of match the, the dish that it's attached to. The sort of interesting part we're zooming in on now, on now is this, this bit at the bottom, this sort of OMT down here, which if we go a little bit deeper into that, looks like this. So it's really just a, a very kind of normally quite simple device, though there's quite a lot of careful design that goes into this, uh, which produces for the two different polarizations, so that's the kind of one polarization in this, this axis and this, this way is the other, other polarization. So we're measuring the two different polarizations and all it's really doing is producing out of this device, uh, it's coupling the electromagnetic, electromagnetic signal into a uh, sort of a voltage, an elect electrical signal, which then gets sort of transferred out of here. And then there's fancy stuff around this to do, uh, to cool this and whatever. So you'll see there's a, a vacuum dome around here in fact, we cool this whole sort of inner part of the of the feed to very low temperatures um, for uh, I think it's something like 20 Kelvin or something that we'll we'll, we'll cool for meerkat. So it will be really really quite low. Um, there's you could, there's a vacuum dome as well, all that to to keep the temperature very low so that you don't have particles and things flying around inside of that. All right. So then, what do you do with this feed? So the feed actually sits on the top of the radio, radio telescope. So this is the cat the cat seven dishes. Um, and that's the only bit that actually has wires attached to it. The rest of this thing, this big antenna, and most of you will know this, is really just a kind of almost like passive reflecting surface. Uh, we built CAT7 out of composite material, but embedded in the, in the surface of the antenna is also a reflecting mesh. Um, we did also a flame spray for a couple of other antennas to do some of the testing. But uh, So the dish itself is, not, uh, is really just a kind of photon collecting bucket. And the bigger the dish, uh, the more photons you collect, or well, the more dishes you have, the more photons you collect. So that's the weaker signals you could detect. And you'll know this from your sort of DST dish, DSTV dish on top of your house. Uh, though maybe you don't watch TV because you're too busy doing astronomy. But um, it, it really is a, a kind of quite a simple thing. You've got a feed that, uh, that a dish that actually collects the photons, a feed at the top, and an electrical cable coming out of it. And that's really all a, a radio telescope is in its sort of basic form. So Justin showed a little bit of this already, just sort of some of the details of this thing. Here's the main reflector. Um, we've got a secondary reflector here for the offset Gregorian case. And then we've got a feed in indexer and we've got a number of different feeds that we can move in and out to change frequency band essentially. The whole antenna can sort of move up and down. So this, this position here is actually where the antenna is sort of looking straight up. Looks a bit strange because you'd expect the dish to maybe be completely vertical, but it's not. Due to the optics, the, sort of the, uh, the radio signals will come in from the top, bounce off the dish, bounce off the secondary reflector, and into the feed there. 
And then we've got helium compressors and things for, for cooling as part of that. All right, Justin also showed this thing, but just to go into this in, in a little bit more detail. So this is a comparison between the, the uh, prime focus dish, which is what CAT7 is, with those four struts with the feet at the top, and the offset Gregorian dish. So that's the main reflector and that sub-reflector. And you can see, as Justin said, and, and these, these patterns here um, are really kind of give you the, how sensitive the dish is in different directions that, uh, to, 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 the, 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 sorry, to the different directions of signal arrival. So a signal arriving right from the top here has sort of, is detected with a greater sensitivity at the top of this peak here. And something coming in from the side will be detected with a sort of much uh, reduced sensitivity. So you can see that there's quite an interesting kind of pattern of structure here with these sort of uh, what we call side lobes uh, on the prime focus dish, which is quite different from the, the offset Gregorian dish. So if you really look at these patterns in detail and you sort of understand what you're trying to do with them, it turns out that the offset Gregorian dish gives you a much sort of cleaner beam. We don't have these interfering structures in the way that cause diffraction problems and all kinds of patterns that we have to try and take out later in the software. All right, we've already, um, Justin showed these pictures of the SK dishes, so the SK dish will look something like that. Um, the dense aperture array tiles, just kind of zooming into what's underneath these things. Uh, Justin showed this picture. So underneath this is a vast array of, of, of dipole sort of elements here. Um, these are the sort of so-called Vivaldi design. And literally, sort of for each of these, or maybe for each couple of them, you would have a, a, a feed coming out. So it's like each of these little ones underneath here has a separate antenna. So you can imagine how much data comes out of such a, such a device uh, when you put it all together. So the immediate thing you try and do with such a, such a thing is reduce the data rate as quickly as possible. Right, the low frequency antennas will look like that, as we've heard, a much sort of simpler thing. Okay, so you've got your radio telescope, um, and now you've got a signal sort of coming out of the thing. And so just with a single dish from CAT7, let's say not, not an interferometer, we're just taking a single dish. You point it up at a, at a known uh, radio source like Baylor, which is a pulsar. Um, I'm sure you all know what pulsars are, so I won't explain that. Um, one thing that Justin didn't note on his slide was that the frequency axis on this plot is actually reversed. Uh, the, the lower frequencies sort of arrive later. So you point this thing up at, up at Baylor, you measure the voltage, and then you just plot it so time this way and split it into different frequency channels in, in this direction. And you can immediately actually see from, from these lines here that the, the pulses from the Baylor, Baylor pulsar. So just with a very simple device, you could do something quite interesting sort of straight away. So that's what we call sort of, um, sort of single dish work or, or working with a time domain signal in particular. You can also do with a single dish, you can make an image. So you could take your dish and you can physically move it. So you just scan it around, do a kind of raster scan around the object that you're interested in. And here's a Centaurus A, and this is a picture from one of our uh, CAT7 dishes. That's the size of the moon. So Centaurus A is a really big uh, radio object on the sky, one of the biggest. And you can get a pretty good picture. And this is a comparison with a, a, a picture made previously uh, with at Harte Biersuk, which has a, a much bigger dish, so kind of finer resolution, so you can see kind of finer structures here. But just for comparison, a single CAT7 dish, uh, it turns out that the, si the size of the dish uh, impacts on the size of the, the beam that you've got. The bigger the dish, the kind of smaller the beam, and the more sensitive it is. So the, the, the better the resolution, the bigger the, bigger, the bigger the dish that you've got. Okay, so now what you can also do is to go from a single dish to what we call an interferometric uh, image. And this is using, let's say, all seven dishes from CAT7 and pointing them at the same object and then doing some, a whole lot of fancy processing to really get to this point here where, where you can resolve out in this little box in the middle that there are in fact two sort of components to this thing. So these are sort of the, the starts, the inner parts of the jet in Centaurus A and there's thought to be this sort of black hole in, in the middle there with the matter falling in that's sort of feeding the jet. Okay, so now we really get to the basics, how to make an interferometer. And hopefully this is some sort of, uh, uh, sort of parallel to, to optical systems that we've got here. So we've got some kind of uh, dish or reflecting surface here, a big mirror or something, and some sort of uh, CCD or whatever at the top. And you, you're getting the, the, the signals in from space, they're bouncing off your reflecting surface, and they're being detected up here. So you start with that. And then what you do is you, you chop your dish into little bits. Okay, so you kind of divide it into segments. 
Um, this is not actually how you would actually make one in real life, okay? This is, this, is, this is an understanding way of how you might make an interferometer. which will help people lead to understanding. Okay, so then what you do is you essentially take, replace this part of the optical path, the dark, dark green one here, uh, with electronics. So you take that out and you, you replace this with wires, all right? So you've still got your sort of feed there, but you've replaced the, the optical path with wires. Okay, and then you kind of move the wires and things onto the ground and you add some cable length delays and all that into the, into the thing. So essentially what you've now got is each element of the dish is now detecting uh, a part of the signal that it, that it was before um, and then the rest of it is being sort of done electronically. Okay, and then you drop those pieces onto the ground because it's, it's really expensive to build an enormous dish like that um, and it's a lot easier to have sort of smaller, smaller collecting elements on the ground. So you just let those, all those bits and pieces that you had up in the air, drop them onto the ground. As you can see, there's no supporting structure anyway, so they will, they will just fall. And there they are, all on the ground. Okay. And now you actually replace each of those little segments of the dish with actual radio telescopes, little sort of sing, single dishes themselves. Okay, so there's, there's a bit of uh, trickery behind the scenes here. I wouldn't call it trickery, but some subtleties. Um, where you, we do that sort of replacement, but uh, hopefully we sort of getting to a point where you can see the, the parallel between where we started with a sort of reflecting telescope and an interferometer. So now essentially what you've got, got is you've, you've, you've taken that dish that was up in the air and all the, the, the signal that was arriving at each point of that dish, you're now collecting it on the ground. Unfortunately though, there's some gaps in between the, the bits here, so you haven't got the full dish anymore, so there's some sort of artifacts and things that come in as part of this process. Okay, so once you've done that, you've thrown everything on the ground, you end up with CAT7, all right? So there's an array, which really is what we've arrived at. So we've got the seven dishes, they're all on the ground, and there's big gaps in between them. So instead of these being part of a bigger reflector that's held up in the sky somewhere, uh, we've actually just moved that whole surface on, onto the ground. Okay, and you can say, well, we're done, it's all happy. Uh, and as I said, well, maybe it's not quite done because there are some gaps and there are some, some artifacts that cause a few issues. <coughs> Okay, so this is some, something of the sort of analogy with the, with the optical mm -hmm. telescope, really. So what, what we've got here is that, and it points to these sort of properties um, that we use quite a lot, the, the mathematical transform called the Fourier transform. So an, an optical telescope essentially does two, implicitly does two Fourier transforms. And a Fourier transform, what's actually happening in a Fourier transform is that at each point of this dish, on the dish surface here, you're getting signal from all parts of the sky. It's coming in from all directions and you, you're getting the sum of all of the, the signal from each part of the sky arriving at, let's say, this point in the dish here. And it turns out that mathematically that is just a Fourier transform operation. If you add up a whole lot of signals from a whole lot of different directions, um, you are doing a Fourier transform. Then the second part of the operation is that you actually focus this up onto a focal, focal plane here. And this, effective, this part of the operation effectively, well, this part of the focal plane essentially sees signal from all parts of the dish. Okay. So this part sees signal from all parts of the sky, this part sees signal from all parts of the dish. So this is essentially kind of a, a second Fourier transform that, that's happening up, up over here in an optical system. Alright, so an optical system essentially does two Fourier transform then. One is at that sort of part of the dish, it does a Fourier transform of the sky, and then in the focal plane you do an inverse Fourier transform of, of, the, of the sky, of the electromagnetic field. The radio telescope, once you've laid, laid it on the ground, we've got rid of that sort of uh, focus part of the thing. We've only got the dish part essentially lying on the ground. So we've only measured the, the Fourier transform of the sky with the interferometer. And we have to do a second Fourier transform to essentially do the focusing to get back to the sky in software. Okay, so the important part of this whole thing, what we really try to get to, is that an interferometer measures the Fourier transform of what's on the sky. Okay, and, and then there's a whole lot of processing that happens, the second Fourier transform and cleaning up of the image that happens in software thereafter. Okay, so now um, the way this actually works is that in order to sort of get to the, the Fourier transform bits that you're interested in, you have to do a correlation between the, 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 the each dish in your array. So every pair of antennas is correlated and you, what we, uh, you produce what we call a complex <laughs> visibility. So it's a kind of complex number. Uh, which is one point on something what we, which we call the UV plane. 
just kind of a spatial frequency representation of what's on the sky. And then as the Earth rotates, this whole, whole sort of thing maps out, uh, sweeps out uh, an arc in the UV plane. And uh, you can do this even with a sort of one-dimensional array. So some arrays are just uh, in the east-west direction, and they rely entirely on the Earth's rotation uh, to produce images and to pull out the UV plane. So this would be an example. In fact, it's a real picture from the, the very large array of, the, of a, a radio source, a very spectacular one with jets coming out, interacting here. So far out in the distance, there's many, many light years, many, many light years across. And this picture is sort of produced by kind of a sampling of the UV plane that looks sort of schematically something like this. So essentially that information that you've got in your picture and the information that you measure on your radio telescope, which is what, what this is directly, so each point in this, this plot here is essentially a, a visibility or one, one of the sort of correlations that you've got between a pair of antennas. So this graph shows us that essentially just by a Fourier transform relation, these two are actually the same. Okay, whether you have a picture like this or whether you represent it in the sort of so-called spatial frequency plane or the UV, UV plane, it actually looks, uh, the information content is the same. Okay, so getting kind of more into the signal part of things. Um, so here's an array of antennas. Um, what we do is we take from every, every two antennas, we take the, the signal from each, each pair of antennas, we correlate it together, and we produce these visibilities. And then uh, this is a plot of uh, visibilities versus time, I think, in this direction here. So it's a visibility amplitude as the, as the um, Earth is rotating or sort of two different polarizations. Uh, this is a plot of, of visibilities versus the, the amplitude of the visibilities versus channels. And you can see it looks sort of a very like random, random signal. Uh, a plot of the sort of UV plane that, that's, that's sort of mapped out by this observation. This is actually a CAT7 observation. So this previous one was more of a sort of schematic and using the VLA. So what we're looking at in, in this plot over here is essentially the same plot here. And you can see this much more sort of sparse sampling of the UV plane. And then doing a Fourier transform and then doing some additional work, which, which isn't shown in this, in this picture, you can produce this picture of Cecinus X1, which is that flaring radio source that Justin talked about earlier. There's the supernova, supernova remnant. All right, so the sampling of the UV plane, i.e. the kind of picture that you get here, and i.e. which relates to the quality of the image that you get out, is dependent on how your array is laid out. Uh, so CAT7... Sorry, for Meerkat, these purple bits, which maybe you can just see, is the sort of road network for, for Meerkat. Justin showed the slide of the sort of inner part of the core. So it, luckily it turns out that this inner part looks quite similar to what's actually been built on the ground. So hopefully the engineers are getting it right there. Um, <laughs> Meerkat, where, when it's sort of fully built, the, the antennas will be sort of laid out like this, uh, the, with the central core here and the sort of outer antennas laid out on the landscape here. Here's this Lossberg Hill that Justin showed with the hills down at the south here and the site complex over there. So the, the, the Lusberg does shield most of the, uh, provide shielding for most of the array from the site complex. And we've built a big earth wall down here as well to sort of add to that. Um, with the SK, it's sort of laid out like this, as we've seen, so quite a different kind of array configuration. So basically the array configuration will determine where these points get plotted in the UV plane. So how much of the UV plane you fill out, and i.e. what kind of images you can, you can produce, and what sort of spatial frequency scales you're sensitive to. So some interferometers will be really good if you put all the antennas really close together. For example, the inner part of Meerkat, the sort of inner part here, will be really good at, at detecting kind of large blobby features, let's say like that. And other parts uh, where you want sort of higher resolution, you want the, the antennas further apart. You want to essentially build a bigger telescope. We all know that if you have a very big, big telescope, you get fine resolution. Same thing with a, with a radio interferometer. So you can see the Meerkat array is a combination of things that are close together and things that are further apart. And likewise for SK, it's got a very sort of dense core and, and things that spread out much further. Okay, so as I've mentioned, there's some sort of caveats here. There's some captures. We don't measure this full UV plane. Thus, we can never actually recover the image fully, and so there's, there's missing information. We've compromised because we haven't filled the whole landscape with dishes. It's too expensive. We've lost information, and so we actually have to kind of guess what was, what was there. <laughs> this is a sort of slight admission from a radio astronomer, but I don't really call myself a radio astronomer, but sort of an instrumentalist, that in fact we, we don't really, we, don't, we can't be 100% sure of what we're measuring. 
We have to rely on prior information, other observations, and build up models. And uh, so the, the, the measurements that you get with it when you're making an image from a radio telescope, there's, there's some inference that goes on. The second problem is that each of the measurements that you make is distorted. Uh, there's sort of instrumental effects, complex receiver gains that change quite quickly over time and they need to be calibrated. Okay, and it's not really the same as optical interferom interferometry at all. Okay, so if you had a, an array that looks something like this, which is uh, the Westerbork sort of layout, and you plot what is, what is known as the point spread function, which is what, what the image would look like if you just had a single point in the middle of your image, a single point on the sky. So let's say you had one bright object, which was a sort of point source on the sky, and you pointed your radio telescope at it, what would, what would the picture look like? So if you used Westerbork, uh, this, is what you, this is what you'd get. Uh, when you've got more than one object on the sky, it gets more complicated. This pattern gets sort of convolved with the objects on the sky. So you get a kind of, you move this pattern around to every point, essentially, uh, do a sort of convolution and sort of addition of all the, the, the power that's in the pattern and on the sky, and, and sort of plot it at, at each point, and you get a much more complicated picture. So basically, this is the, re the response to a point source. Uh, it's the Fourier transform of the UV coverage. So the, the more UV coverage you've got, the fuller the UV coverage, uh, usually the better in terms of uh, the point that you get here, because if you fully sample the UV plane, then this would just be a sort of a single point at the middle. We know from a Fourier transform, Fourier transform operation that kind of a point or a delta function in a, in a, uh, of, a, of a signal if you take a Fourier transform of that, it spreads out completely across the UV plane. Okay. Uh, right, so essentially you could say that the structure here is sort of related to the uncertainty in where things are in, in your image. Okay, so this is what it looks like in practice. <laughs> so you make an image and it looks actually something like that. And this is before you've done the sort of cleaning up part, before you release it to publicity mechanisms and things. Um, what we've got here is essentially a convolution of that point spread function uh, with all the bright sources in our image. So you can see it's quite a mess actually. So there's a bright source over here and there are all these rings that are around it. There's a source over here, there's rings around it, etc. So what you need to do to kind of get it at the stuff that's underneath here is take out all the bright sources and their effects of the rings. Because fortunately you actually know what this, this pattern looks like. You know that your arrays are laid out in a certain way. You know you observe for so long, so the Earth rotated so much. And uh, so you know what that pattern looks like. And so you can say, okay, well, looking at this, I think there's a bright point over here, a bright source. I'm going to assume it's a point source. It may not be, but that's my first assumption. And I'm going to take out a pattern that corresponds to the brightness of that source. And hopefully it will remove all these other rings associated with it. And you kind of repeat that for other, other sources around the thing. Okay, so this sort of deconvolution, which is the process I've, I've described a little bit, is required to get to the Spain stuff. And then, unfortunately, because there's missing in information, there's a whole possibility of different kinds of skies that could actually fit your data. So what this deconvolution process does, it sort of picks one and makes some extra assumptions, like this, the source in the middle is a point source, etc. Okay, the second catch is that there are distorted measurements. Um, because of phase errors in your instrument, things change over time, drifts as, as the sun changes, the temperature of the cables change, and, the, and you get all kinds of effects that have to be calibrated out. And the effects, effects of these phase changes are to, just, uh, are to move the, the information around in your image. So a source that you, a radio source you think was over there, actually ends up being smeared out around the rest of the image. And this is a rather extreme example of that. You can see that really you can get no scientifically useful information out of, out of such an image. And so you have to do the sort of calibration that, that will, will fix this up. All right, now, uh, yes. Okay, so there's, a, there's something called self-cal, which is um, uh, the technique that's sort of most widely used these days for producing high-quality radio images. Um, and, some, and it's worked extraordinarily well, despite the fact that people don't really know how it works in terms of a mathematical background. Um, and, uh, but yet it does seem to work and you can, sort of, in a repeatable way, produce uh, <coughs> images of the sky that look plausible and match up with other observations. Okay, so radio astronomy has achieved incredible results, i.e. Um, million to one dynamic range in your images, despite using incestuous calibration methods held together with spit, duct tape, bailing wire, and oral tradition. <laughs> okay, and if you go into this field, you actually find that there are only like, literally about 10 people that understand 
the intricacies of how to calibrate a, a, a radio interferometer. Alex Murnoff, fortunately, is one of them, but even he is, says, he has a sort of quote I've got at the end of the talk, if you think you understand interferometry, you don't. Okay. <laughs> so if you're feeling lost now, don't worry, you, you're in the best company. The, the experts in the world actually have trouble with this, this area as well. So the self-cal technique looks something like this. So what you do is you observe some known calibrators around the sky. So you look at some bright, bright sources that are fairly kind of point-like, and you do some observations of those. And then you immediately move to your actual area of interest. So you first observe a kind of known source, then you go to where you want to be, and you, and you observe there for a while, and then you go back to your calibrator, and you go back to your, your, your source of interest, and you go back to your calibrator. It's a kind of a repeatable way. So you may spend the two minutes on the calibrator, and then you may spend five or ten minutes on your, on your actual source of interest, then you go back to your calibrator, and etc. And using that, that, that process, you can do a sort of pre-calibration where you use the calibrators, the, the calibrators, because you know what they are, they're kind of bright sources in the middle of your image, uh, to correct, to make some initial correction for your complex gains, which is the, the tricky part of the radio telescope. Those phase shifts and the complex numbers that are changing over time. So you make what we call is a, a dirty image then of, of your source using these gains. Uh, you deconvolve this thing and you generate a sort of a rough initial sky model. So the sky model is really just uh, a representation of, of what's in, in your field of interest. So you may say, okay, well, I think my rough initial sky model is that there's a point source over here, there's a kind of slightly blobby thing here, there's one in the middle, and there's two over there. And that's your sort of starting point for the next phase, which is this sort of incestuous self cal loop, where essentially now you, you, you've used the information from the, from the calibrators, you're sort of discarding that in a way, and now you go around this loop where you say, Okay, so I'm going to solve for the gains using my current sky model. So I've generated a sky model, now I'm going to kind of look at the data and solve for the gains that would give me this sky model. I'll then correct uh, for those gains, make another dirty image, deconvolve that. Uh, you can also sort of subtract the actual model from that and work with the residual image. I'll update that sky model and kind of rinse and repeat. Okay, so yeah. kind of a washing cycle in a way. So you really are kind of cleaning up your image. Uh, in the process. And this actually works. Remarkably enough, it actually works. Uh, <laughs> and that very spectacular image I showed earlier with the, the big jets coming out with amazing things, that was made using these, these kind of techniques. Okay, there, there are some serious uh, limitations with this as well. Though. There's one complex gain per antenna for the entire field of view. So you're assuming that if there's any kind of interesting effects due to sort of uh, distortions in your antenna or whatever, that you're only correcting for the central point of each antenna beam. You're not correcting for the whole field of view. Remember that the, the beam is not infinitely narrow from each telescope. It has a sort of a, a reasonably large field of view. Typically for a Meerkat antenna, it's going to be about one degree or so. So across that one degree, uh, there's some su significant changes between the middle of, the, of, the, of your, your one degree and the, the edges of it. And uh, unfortunately, the self cal doesn't deal with that. And so these, and also, so the dir the direction dependent effects are, are a problem, as I've described. And polarization is not really well uh, dealt with there as well. All right. So something that's introduced sort of more recently is something called the measurement equation, which gives at least some kind of mathematical formalism for how to work with radio telescopes. And it's really quite neat. And uh, I'll spare you the the agony of looking at what what these equations look like. Uh, if you don't use the measurement equation, but basically each with the measurement equation formulation, which is sort of now the sort of becoming the accepted way of looking at these things, what this says is that the subscribed brightness distribution, which is over here, which can re be represented by a, a two-dimensional, um, sorry, uh, yeah, so each of these each of these J terms is a two-dimensional uh, two by two matrix. This is the sky distribution here, and this is the, the actual thing that you measure with your interferometer. The visibilities. So what this is, is that the, the visibilities are related to the sky distribution by a, a sort of matrix a multiplier operation on the, on the right hand side here involving all the different effects which are sort of modeled as linear uh, going out in a kind of onion form of, of a, a matrix equation here where the left hand side represents um, yeah, sort of one of the antennas in your, in your correlation and uh, the right hand side represents the other antenna. So for, for antenna P and antenna Q, uh, these are all the effects associated with antenna P, the ionosphere, gain effects, etc., polarization effects, and these are the effects in, uh, relating to antenna Q. 
So you can sort of work with this equation, and it does at least give you some handle on, on what's going on. Um, all right, so I think I'm running probably quite short on time, but how, how much time do we have left? Oh! <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so just to sort of close off then, uh, to kind of link this back to uh, how to do these things uh, properly and, and then also to do them how, how to make these images quickly. So we, we've had uh, the self-cal uh, sort of revolution in a way which, which was able to take radio telescopes from a dynamic range of about a thousand to one to about a million or two million to one. Um, the new approach with the measurement equation and some of the, the new direction dependent effects can improve things even further, uh, but they are very sort of manually intensive. Um, unfortunately, the sort of manual intensive part of things can't be dealt with uh, very well with the new new radio telescopes like Meerkat. So this is an example of because of the data rates, and this is an example of, of Meerkat data rates. Uh, so typically, coming out of the the correlator in terms of the visibilities, we've got a figure up here of about 226 gigabits per second, or 226 gigabits per second, in terms of that raw data coming out of here something like 500 gigabits per second. Um, so, and this could even be simultaneous in, in Meerkat. We can have kind of simultaneous observations going on. So you can, you're getting up to something like a terabit per second uh, data rates coming, coming out of the sort of first stage of the processing for, for Meerkat. It all goes into a big archive and whatever, and there's virtual observatories and things attached to it. And there's different sort of processing pipelines that happen along the way here, both in the sort of time domain and in the sort of imaging area source extraction and cataloging sort of towards the end of it. But really what the, the message of the slide is that we can't do these things in the way that we've done them in the past where the expert astronomer sits there, looks and goes, that looks like some sort of residual effect here, or there's some data that I need to kind of flag out of here, remove from here, and sort of gets his mouse and goes click. Yeah. You can't do that anymore. We have to find automated ways to, to actually deal with the data. So we are working on this and other observatories are working on this. The problem is that this is just the sort of meerkat scale uh, for SKA dishes, the phase one, we, we expect the data rate to be sort of 10 to 20 times larger. Okay, so for the imaging data rate here, which was about 200, and 200 gigabits per second, so 10 to 20 times larger for, for Meerkat, and likewise sort of much bigger storage as well. Um, and for phase two dishes, 100 to 1,000 times Meerkat. So and that's, that's going to be really significant. So kind of exabytes of storage and exaflops of computing, hence the large computing. So the real sort of pressing challenges are that the data rates are really high. We, need, uh, we can't have this sort of human, human in the loop anymore. You've seen some of the subtle effects now. Hopefully you're now experts in radio interferometry, or at least you understand that you don't understand. Um, and you can see that some of these subtle effects are quite difficult to get rid of, and you really do need a lot of computing to try and make, make headway and make progress with them, and in particular automated computing. Um, so we need to deal with things like the wide field of view, wide bandwidth, direction dependent gains, to, in order to reach the kind of full science performance. In fact, there's no guarantee that the SK, once it's fully built with all its collecting area, will be able to do the science that it claims it's, it's aiming to do. Because it may be that there are some instrumental effects that, that only show up at the very extreme sensitivities that we don't know how to get rid of yet. I'm sure we're in, over time we'll work out how to do it, but initially we may not be able to do it. Um, there's still some approximate techniques that are needed, even though we have this sort of formalism of the measurement, measurement equation, which makes things look a lot neater, even as part of that, some approximate techniques. And there's some statistical techniques that sort of show some promise as well, but at the moment they just re they take up too much computing. The self call works quite well because it doesn't use too much computing, it makes certain assumptions. Um, the, the sort of more complicated things, direction dependent effects, take more computing. And the statistical techniques, which will maybe deal with it in a sort of Bayesian way or something like that, take even more. So that's, that's really quite tricky. Okay, so we've covered the top one. I think you, you now at least understand that. Uh, uh, we are, however, making progress with the sort of existing arrays, CAT7, Meerkat, all the other existing uh, telescopes around the world. And uh, we're going to need a lot of sort of new algorithms, implementations, um, as part of what we're doing, and in fact we have, we're building up skills to do that. Um, and then just to finally say, it's, it's really exciting times, um, not only for South Africa and Africa, uh, radio astronomy in general with these big new instruments and, and all the interest and the funding and the excitement that's around them and the science. Um, I th certainly I think uh, we are kind of lucky to be in the times that we're in. So thank you very much.
just ask you to what extent the Alma array in Chile has to face the same problems because I mean, it's even further developed stage than, than our Yes, they, they do in fact certainly have to face similar problems. So some of the software packages that they're working on are things we're keeping a close eye on as well. The CASA package, for example, for doing making images. Uh, they're also having trouble keeping up with the data rates currently um, and trying to make parallel versions of those packages, you know, run across supercomputers and things. So indeed, they, they are facing similar problems. The, there are differences in, in some of the things because they're working at higher frequencies and things. They get different kinds of calibration effects that they have to deal with. And of course, their beam widths and things are different. So, yeah, it's similar but not, not the same.